Hammerstein, horse specialist at University of Georgia. And as part of our forage education video series, um, I decided that we would do a little bit of a discussion on toxins that would be related to forages. So that would include things like toxic plants and contaminants in your hay. Um, in my role as a horse specialist, I answer questions from horse owners all around the state. And one of the more common groups of questions that I get would be regarding plants that might be toxic in the pasture or potential contaminants in horse hay. So unfortunately a horse is a very sensitive animal so there are a lot of things that can be toxic to horses. Uh, the good news is that horses do a very good job if they are able they do a very good job of avoiding things that are toxic. Um, that being said, as responsible horse owners, what we want to do is try to minimize any exposure to toxic plants or contaminants that might be found in the hay um, and give them a chance, if possible, to avoid any, um, any potential toxins that might be in their environment. So today's video, we're going to give you some tips on how to do that. All right, let's start off by discussing potential toxins in hay. Most people are trained to look for trash, weeds, and mold in their hay. When feeding hay, all strings should be removed and no trash should be in the hay. If a horse eats form bodies like hay string, this can lead to the formation of something called enteroliths in the horse's gut. Enteroliths are mineral deposits that form around a form body and they eventually form a large stone that can't pass through the horse's GI tract and it has to be surgically removed. So you wanna make sure that there isn't any debris, even from loose string in your horse's hay when you feed it to them. You also wanna make sure that the hay isn't too dusty. Dust typically comes from mold growing on the hay, and this often indicates that it was baled when it's too wet, or it's been stored for too long. Many horses are sensitive to molds, which can lead to respiratory issues, especially in our horses that are stalled. Also, some molds can produce something called mycotoxins, which can be harmful to the horse. If a horse is given a choice, most of them will avoid moldy hay due to its unpalatability. But sometimes if they have nothing else to eat, they'll go ahead and eat that mold. Other contaminants that we might want to consider in hay are specific to certain types of forages. Blister beetles, for example, are mainly associated with alfalfa hay. Blister beetles produce a substance called cantharidin, and this cantharidin can cause severe irritation to the mucosa of horses, and it can be fatal even in small quantities. Every part of a blister beetle can cause significant symptoms and even death in horses, even if it's just a small piece of that blister beetle. Alfalfa should be inspected for blister beetles, when you break open that hay to feed horses. Blister beetles can come in different colors and patterns, but this picture shows their general shape. They're approximately half an inch to slightly over an inch in size, so they're not very big. And remember, you're also wanting to look for pieces of blister beetles, which can be hard to find. Because they're so difficult to sometimes find in the hay, if possible, it's best to buy alfalfa from the first cutting of a field. Blister beetles typically swarm later in the summer months, and therefore, if you buy that first cutting of hay, it would typically be cut before these, be before these beetles would appear in hay fields. Another type of forage species that we need to consider carefully is tall fescue. Tall fescue has an endophyte associated with it that can cause reproductive problems in broodmares. We cover this in depth in our video on types of forages for horses, so go back and check that out if you want more information. This endophyte is stable in hay, so even if your broodmare is not out on fescue pasture, you can still get problems if you're feeding her fescue hay in later gestation. Fescue can result in several problems, including stillbirths and a condition called eglactia, which means no milk production. Clover is another forage that we need to touch upon. It's found in many horse pastures and it can provide benefits to the pasture by fixing nitrogen, as well as serve as a beneficial forage source for horses. However, 
It can cause excessive salivation in horses, also known as slaughters, which isn't typically a problem for the horse, but it can be really worrisome for horse owners if they don't recognize the cause of this condition. Clover itself isn't toxic, but sometimes a fungus called black patch grows on the clover and this fungus produces a compound called slaphramine. It's most prevalent in cooler, wetter times of the year. The slaphramine will stimulate the salivary glands in the horse and it will cause excessive drooling in horses, sometimes what seems like buckets full of drooling. It's more commonly thought of as being associated with red clover, but it can affect white clover as well, and it can be present in clover haze. In most horses, slaphramine doesn't cause symptoms other than the salivation, so it isn't really considered a problem. However, consider removing your horse from a clover pasture at susceptible times of the year if this condition concerns you. Toxic weeds in trees and pastures are also a concern for most horse owners. As a responsible horse owner, it's good to inspect your pastures regularly for potential toxic plants, but you also have to recognize that it's almost impossible to completely get rid of them in your pasture. Two big things that you want to be aware of with regards to toxicity in plants is that the palatability of the plant and the concentration of the toxin are important to consider. So for example, if we compare a holly tree to a yew tree, we can see a huge difference in the amount that the horse has to eat in order to have any toxic symptoms. Holly trees are technically considered a toxic species, but the average horse would have to eat about three to five pounds before it showed any symptoms. And even then, it would likely only show symptoms like GI upset and colic. A yew tree, on the other hand, can cause death with just a single bite. So when we worry about toxic plants, it's important to be most concerned about the ones that can cause problems in small amounts. And the second part of that equation is recognizing the plants that horses would be most likely to eat. Many of our toxic plants are not very palatable. They taste bad, so horses avoid them. The ones that are most concerning are the few that the horse might develop a taste for and want to voluntarily eat. So for example, there are some reports that yew trees might be palatable for horses. Given that they already have a high concentration of toxin, these trees are a very high concern near horse pastures. Toxic plants should also be considered based on the environment where they're most likely to grow. Some weeds grow in wet marshy environments, so if you had a pond or a marsh area, you'd want to know what, for, what to inspect for in these areas. Some toxic plants grow more in shady forested environments, and some grow more in open fields. It's important to know what toxic plants to look for in each environment. One of the major toxic weeds of the southeast that would grow in a wet environment is water hemlock. It only takes about half a pound of this plant to be fatal. So this is one to be on the lookout for if you keep horses near a waterway or marsh. A similar plant that grows more upland is poison hemlock. It's also toxic to horses and it looks a lot like water hemlock, but it grows in drier areas. However, with poison hemlock, horses have to consume about 10 times more of this plant compared to water hemlock to be lethal. Bracken fern is another toxic plant, and this one can grow in a wide variety of environments. Toxins in this plant can accumulate over time, so if the horse is chronically grazing it, that toxicity might not show up for several months. Other toxic weeds to be aware of in pastures or wooded areas, or especially along fence lines like you see here, would include nightshades. In this picture, the nightshade doesn't have the berry present. It's a little green berry right now, but as that plant matures, that berry would turn to a dark, almost black color. There's other varieties of nightshades in addition to this nightshade with the blackberry, and that would include something like horse nettle that you see here with these white flowers. Other potential toxic plants that are common in pastures would be something like pokeweed or 
perilament, which usually has a purplish color to the underside of the leaves, and bitter sneezeweed. Johnson grass is also considered somewhat low in toxicity for horses, but should still be considered a toxic weed, and you should remove it from horse pastures due to its potential to accumulate cyanide. It's also sometimes a contaminant that you might see in horse hay. Here are a few more examples of toxic plants. So going from left to right, we have showy crotillaria, we have jimson weed in the middle, and we have castor bean on the right. These are all plants that are fairly unpalatable, but they should be considered as potential contaminants of pasture, hay, or even sometimes grains. And this gives you a good example of what these particular weeds look like, um, both the leaf and in some instances the flower are showing. When you're assessing your horse's risk for toxic plants, you again really want to remember that it's almost impossible to remove all potential toxins from your horse's environment. The better strategy is to make sure that your horse is on a good nutritional program. Most toxic plants aren't very palatable, so horses tend to leave them alone unless they're hungry or bored and have nothing else to eat. Remember, when you're thinking about this, that horses tend to eat about 2% of their body weight on a dry matter basis each day. So even if you're feeding your horse a good quality grain and it's holding its weight fine, if it's going for long parts of the day with nothing to chew on, no forage to eat, it's more prone to grazing those plants that it would ordinarily leave alone. Make sure that your horse has access to good quality forage throughout the day, and this will help prevent them from sampling things that might be toxic. Also, we've got to consider the role of good pasture management. Weeds are much less likely to grow in pastures that have a good stand of established grass. If you see a pasture like this that's been severely overgrazed, those weeds are much more likely to take over and be prevalent in the pasture for the horse to graze. In our next video, we're going to talk a lot about pasture management and how to prevent weeds from overtaking your pasture. All right, to wrap up, let's talk a little bit about trees in horse pastures. Trees provide shade and a wind block for pastured horses, and they also provide a nice privacy screen for your farm. Because they have these benefits, horse owners usually want to keep trees in and around their pasture. Trees can be safely incorporated into pastures if you use good management strategies and know which trees to plant and keep in your pasture and which trees to remove. The main thing to do is to choose your trees carefully if possible. If possible, try not to plant toxic trees near horse pastures. And if you have pastures where there are already toxic trees present, you want to consider either completely removing them or fencing horses off of them. Major toxic trees would include things like yew trees, these should always be removed, black locust trees, and horse chestnut or buckeye trees. Cyanide producing trees that horses should definitely be kept away from include cherry trees, peach or plum trees, and maple trees. If it's not an option to remove these trees from where your horse is grazing, you want to recognize that the toxic part of the plant is the wilted leaves. So a good management strategy if you can't remove horses would be to fence horses completely away from these trees by fencing them well off the drip line of the tree. The drip line of the tree is the point at which the, the branches or leaves are most extended away from the tree. Basically what you're trying to do is prevent the horse from coming into any contact with leaves that may fall from the tree. Trees that may be considered toxic based on the fruit or nut that they form would be oaks and persimmons. Oak trees can be toxic to horses, particularly the green acorns and the new leaves. Persimmons are another tree that can be toxic if the horse decides to eat that persimmon fruit. 
not because the fruit itself is toxic, but because it can cause a phytobasal or a blockage in the GI tract. Less common trees that would be considered toxic would be the Russian olive, the Kentucky coffee tree, and the golden chain tree. Many ornamentals, including landscaping plants like rhododendron, which would be azaleas, box elders, and lantana, like you see here, are considered toxic. In general, before you do any landscaping around your pasture or barn to try to make it prettier, check and make sure that what you're planting isn't going to harm your horse because many of our commonly used landscaping plants can be toxic for horses. This video hopefully gave you a quick overview on things that you want to consider when you're thinking about potential toxicities related to your horse's forage program. This is an area where your county extension agent can really help you. They are available to come to your farm and they're also trained to identify potential toxic weeds and plants that might be present in your pastures. In the next two videos, we're going to talk about establishing and maintaining a good quality pasture, which will go a long way to helping you eliminate your risk of toxic plants. So make sure you check those out next. A special thank you to the Georgia Equine Commodity Commission for funding this video. And thank you so much for tuning into this series. Please join us for some more videos on forage education for horse owners.